Good afternoon. Welcome to the May edition of the Thousand Oaks Council on Aging. We have a wonderful program ahead of us, so let's get started. Uh, Commissioner Healy, would you uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Francine, would you call the roll, please? Absolutely. Commissioner Borging? Here. Commissioner Fotheringham? Here. Commissioner Grimm? Present. Commissioner Healy? Here. Commissioner Loomis? Former intelligence officer, here. <laughs> Commissioner Norkin? Here. here. Commissioner Shentez? Here. Commissioner Sudan? Here. And Commissioner Silberberg is absent. Thank you. We move on to uh, public comments, which is uh, agenda item number three. And we have one speaker, and that would be uh, dear Miss Birdwell. Come on and talk to us, Brenda. Uh, Brenda is from Senior Concerns. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing today? Nice to see you all here. I just wanted to tell you about a few things that Senior Concerns has coming up. My name is Brenda Birdwell. I'm the Program Development Director. This coming Tuesday at 7 o'clock, we're having a speaker series at Senior Concerns on Hospice Care. And then on June the 14th, we have a chronic disease self-management class coming up that I'll be teaching. It's a six-week class at the Goebel Center, and there's information, both flyers, on the table in the back. So please take them, and we'd like to see you again. Thank you, Brenda. Don't go too far. <laughs> now uh, we're leading up to our program and uh, understanding what's going on with Alzheimer's. I would like to introduce our, our moderator, who is Brenda Birdwell. Brenda is a certified senior advisor and has been in the past a certified domestic violence advisor and advocate and has worked for the uh, Ventura County District Attorney's Office <clears throat> dealing with uh, domestic violence and elder abuse. And she's currently the Senior Advisor and the Program Development Director for Senior Concerns. Brenda will introduce the rest of our distinguished panel. Brenda? Hi, I came from very far, so I'm glad I got here on time. Um, today, besides myself, Brenda Birdwell again from Senior Concerns, we have Dr. Gilbert Rushton from California State Channel Islands, Dr. Stephen Rusek from Kaiser Permanente, and Maureen Simons, the Director of Programs for Senior Concerns. So Shakespeare called memory the barter of the brain, charged with keeping watch over an individual's personal account of being. If this century begins to fail, a person's own record of self is endangered. This is a frightening prospect for most people. Memory loss can, can range from age-related impairment to several types of dementia. We're here today to get the most recent facts on research, diagnosis, and treatment for Alzheimer's disease. To start off, we have Dr. Gilbert Rishton. He's the founder and director of the California State Channel Islands Alzheimer's Institute. He conducts research, authors scientific papers, and submits patent applications for Alzheimer's disease drug development. And as Andrea Gallagher says in her latest The Other Side of 50 column in the Thousand Oaks Acorn, Dr. Rishton is in a race against time. His enemy is Alzheimer's disease. Why the race? An estimated 10 million American baby boomers who are now between the ages of 47 and 65 will develop the disease in their lifetime. That translates to one out of every eight baby boomers. So Dr. Rishton, could you give us a little background about Alzheimer's and tell us about your most recent research? Well, I think the most important background that I could share about Alzheimer's disease is that we've come to a new um, sort of new milestone in understanding the disease, and traditionally it's been thought of as a disease of memory loss. And if you remember back 30 years or so, we would refer to it as senility in a general way. And so Alzheimer's disease is, of course, um, a disease that um, people recognize initially by memory loss in their friends and loved ones, but Ultimately, it's neurodegeneration that's driving the disease. It'll affect your entire brain, your entire body. And I think many of you have already had experience with Alzheimer's patients in that um, we need to have a sort of a mechanism-based drug, what we call a disease-modifying drug, to 
slow or prevent neurodegeneration, not just something that stimulates memory, but something that stops the disease at its mechanism. I think that's the most important background information I can give for this presentation. Ask that second question again, please. Okay, could you tell us about your most current research, please? I can launch into it right now, if that's fine. Um, I'm going to give a presentation today, which I'm calling Progress Toward Disease-Modifying Alzheimer's Drugs, and I'll talk a little bit about um, the what I call the geriatric demographic. That's the result of our increasing longevity, more and more older people surviving older and older age. Uh, I'm going to talk about drug development and trying to address age-related cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease, which I believe people will recognize as the most dramatic unmet medical need of our time. And I'm going to end up talking a little bit about um, nutrition and medical foods. People always enjoy listening uh, uh, about that because it's something you can do currently, something you can do right now. Uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit about uh, what we do on campus at the Alzheimer's Institute. Uh, you can see my name and my email address are on the screen right now. I will show it again on the last uh, slide as well. So I live locally, and you can always contact me. And if you want to continue the discussion or have any questions, please uh, feel free to do that. I want to thank the Council on Aging and Senior Concerns. I'm happy to be up here with Steve and Maureen today. And here we go. So the geriatric demographic, I think I coined that, um, just uh, sort of the study of our increasing longevity. And I think uh, disease and drug therapy in the aged becomes one of the most important issues because of our increasing longevity. I'm going to talk a little bit today about uh, centenarians, people who are 100 years old or more, and diseases of the age that result uh, or they have a higher incidence because of our, our, our increasing longevity. Uh, particularly drugs that treat age-related chronic disease. I'm going to talk about the goodness of the drug industry, and I always expect to hear somebody boo when I say that, but um, I will make the point that the pharmaceutical industry is our most important partner moving forward into the future. Uh, I won't really talk about generic drugs except to say right now that they're very good. They're exactly the same drugs, and we get them for a lot cheaper, so I'm not going to talk about that in the presentation today. Some of the trends in medicine, particularly uh, nutrition and food-related alternative medicines, and I'll talk about the disease itself a little bit and how we look at it as drug development scientists. I am not a neurologist or an MD. I'm a medicinal chemist, which means I am in the early stages of drug discovery and drug development. I make the new molecules for clinical testing in Alzheimer's disease. So I, I really like this picture, and this woman reminds me of my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, who lived to be 101, but uh, um, she was always interested in my work, and I can almost hear what this woman is saying right now. She's uh, saying, I love the modern pharmaceutical industry. And um, <laughs> so she's uh, supporting one of the points I'll be trying to make today, and uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> uh, uh, I was really fascinated by this uh, advertisement by Allstate and it says, um, consider this, Hallmark sold 85,000 happy 100th birthday cards last year. And I thought, that's amazing. There's 85,000 100-year-old people. And then I thought, well, did, they, did all 100-year-old people get a Hallmark card? Or maybe somebody got two Hallmark cards? And I don't know, is that just in the U.S. or is it around the world? So that made me curious. And I had to go and... and find out more about this. So I started thinking about this, and uh, people refer to these 100-year-olders uh, as centenarians, and we even have a new category called super centenarians who are 110 years and older. And this article I was reading where I got this term from, super centenarians, a doctor commented that super centenarians are like a new species on planet Earth. It's the first time we've really had a chance to study them as a group and learn about their health and their sickness and whatnot. So I was curious as to how many centenarians we have now and how does that compare to the past? Are the numbers increasing? I'm sure they are, but let's check it out. Um, are the number of centenarians outpacing the increase of the general population? And, you know, why are the numbers of centenarians increasing? And, you know, we can pretty much guess healthcare, medicine, nutrition, and lifestyle probably play a role. So I went to the U.S. Census, which is generally very reliable, and this is a study done way back in 1990, but they made projections, and I'm, I just will bring your attention to that green box, and it, it's the middling statistics. It says, based on three different ways, they 
determined um, how many centenarians there are in the U.S. population. These were the middle of the road statistics, so not, um, they're probably the most reliable. But at any rate, you can see that between the year 2000 and the year 2050, the number of centenarians in the U.S. is expected to go between from 72,000 to 834,000 by 2050. And that's pretty interesting, and it's obviously quite a dramatic change. Um, I was also, my attention was drawn to the percent female um, survivors. At age 100, there are between 83 and 85 percent female survivors. So that says something, I think, about the capacity for survival for women. And it might also say something about either the lack of that capacity in men or uh, some sort of men's health crisis that people haven't quite defined yet. So I had to reduce this down to numbers that I could understand. I figured, uh, I wonder how many centenarians are in 10,000 people, like in your neighborhood or in your community. How many uh, people 100 years or older? And I plotted this on this plot year by year versus um, increasing population in general. And I divided out, you know, per 10,000 people, what does that mean? So in 1990, you can imagine you had one to two centenarians in your community of 10,000 people. Uh, tw by 2050, there will be 21 to 22 uh, centenarians per 10,000 people. Again, a dramatic increase. And what the blue balls on the, on the plot show is the increase in the number of 100-year-old people versus the increase in the general population in the same communities. And you can see that the increase in centenarians is outpacing the increase in the general population. So that makes you wonder why. And it, it certainly does have something to do with health care. So there are some trends here uh, in disease and treatment, and this brings me sort of to the pharmaceutical industry. Since the early 1900s, drug development has essentially cured many acute diseases, like infection. And I list uh, tuberculosis, diarrhea, and it goes on and on. People used to get sick and die of sinus infection, of tooth decay, of surgery. And what's changed all this is simply good sanitation and surgical techniques, new vaccines, and anti-infective drugs. Acute disease is curable, and to a large extent in our developed society, acute diseases have been cured. So that's great news, and that results in people living past 65, and that results in a whole new challenge, which is age-related chronic disease. The big difference between acute disease and chronic disease is we're developing drugs to manage chronic disease, not to cure chronic disease. It's um, a completely different approach. So if you have an infection and you're taking penicillin, you might take it for three to six weeks and then you stop when you're cured, but you cannot stop taking your medicine for your uh, age-related chronic diseases. You're going to be managing that likely through the course of your life. So chronic diseases include, of course, cardiovascular and respiratory, and I go down the list. So kidney and inflammation could be um, autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes and obesity, and dementia, including Alzheimer's disease. These are all age-related and chronic, and it's sort of a new challenge in drug development, and we've done a very good job at taking care of things like heart disease, cholesterol levels, blood pressure. You know, there was a time when people would go to, ho go to the hospital for high blood pressure, and they might be in there for two or three weeks, and they might die in their hospital bed from high blood pressure, and now blood pressure is managed very effectively, um, and... It has to be managed throughout the course of your life. So the bottom line for, from this is that, you know, since the 1950s, uh, new drugs for chronic diseases have been developed, and um, it has really decreased death by um, these diseases dramatically, and people, once again, are living longer. Um, and as I said earlier, the acute diseases have been very effectively treated and are keeping people living longer and keeping people out of the hospital, which is a point I'm going to be making uh, repeatedly in the next few slides. So those are the accomplishments of the pharmaceutical industry. And um, here, you know, I'm showing a list of large pharmaceutical companies. And again, you can, might get some boos from the audience when you notice that those numbers are in the millions, and so we're talking about 40, $46 billion um, of sales for Pfizer and GlaxoSmithKline and Sanofi Aventis. But once again, uh, this money that they're making, I would argue, is well-deserved, and these companies are truly our um, most powerful and most important partners in age-related disease moving into the future. 
And we have to get them thinking about Alzheimer's disease and dementia any way we can. So here are the, the best-selling drugs for uh, diseases of the age, and I'm sure you know people uh, in this room are um, using drugs for these conditions. And uh, again, these are among the most lucrative drugs, so the pharmaceutical industry is certainly focused on the aged population, um, but they have not yet been successful in developing effective treatments for dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So here's the really good thing about the pharmaceutical company and pharmaceuticals in general, and that is that hospitalization is very expensive. So over the last few years, you can see that uh, for a hospital stay between, um, it's right around five or six days, that the price is rising dramatically uh, up to, in 2004, up over $8,000 for, for a hospital stay. And this is a very important thing. So when you're in the hospital, when you're getting receiving clinical care, that's what's really impacting our entire health care system. And, and people say, well, what about the drugs? Every time I go to the drugstore, it's so expensive, and I can't believe what they charge. Well, this pie chart will show you that the, the, the largest uh, health care expenditures are in hospital care and physician and clinical services, obviously. And then I don't know, even know what the other professional services are that constitute 10% there, but you can see that prescription drugs um, make up 10% uh, of that pie. And that investment into prescription drugs is battling back hospital care and physician and clinical care dramatically. If there were no prescription drugs, those expenses would be relatively out of control. So I'm just trying to make the point that pharmaceuticals play a very important role in age-related uh, disease. And so once again, the goodness of the pharmaceutical industry cured acute diseases people lived longer. Manage chronic diseases of the aged, people live even longer. We've got extended lifespan, increasing longevity, and improved quality of life. And these are fairly cost-effective uh, therapies that decrease hospital and clinical costs. And then why does everybody hate the pharmaceutical industry? And these are just my proposals, but they're terrible at public relations. People They've never come on, you know, and made themselves warm and fuzzy to the general public. They just can't do it because people think it's all about the money for them. And they don't really think about, you know, the high cost of hospital stays relative to the cost of pharmaceuticals. And health care generally seems out of control to people, and somehow they do blame the pharmaceutical companies. So we've had all these health care debates, and I don't think the drug company's image has improved at all. And, uh, you know, if you think about the crazy pharmaceutical company commercials and all the side effects that they have to talk about and everything, I think people get very impatient with that. And uh, that's just a requirement by the FDA. All those side effects occur in less than 1% in clinical trials of the people taking the drug. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, age-related diseases, and it's interesting that many of the age-related diseases appear as what we refer, refer to now as syndrome diseases. So if you've ever heard of metabolic syndrome, it seems to be a combination of liver dysfunction, obesity, and diabetes. It's certainly age-related, but it can start very relatively young, and it is related directly to cardiovascular disease. So when people come into the doctor's office, you know, they're exhibiting symptoms of all of these diseases. And the doctor will say, please, you're going to have to change your diet. I'm going to give you a couple of medications. Come back. Uh, I want you to lose 20 pounds and come back in three months. And they come back and they've gained 30 pounds. And the um, syndrome diseases are really out of control because the drugs treat only the symptoms for one or two of the diseases. But what's driving these syndrome diseases, if you look under these colorful rings that I've got up there, what's driving metabolic syndrome and inflammation syndrome is a systemic inflammation which is initiated and sustained by oxidative stress. So oxidative stress increases over life, over the lifespan, um, and it is, uh, inflammation is directly proportional to oxidative stress. And some people suffer these very badly, uh, this, these syndrome diseases, for a combination of reasons. And later I'll talk about nutrition or malnutrition as being one of those. Interestingly, there are connections now between these syndrome diseases and brain diseases, dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So I think it's very important for us to see that these age-related diseases are driven by underlying mechanisms, and we've developed no drugs for these underlying mechanisms. So this brings me a little bit into nutrition right now, and um, you can see that uh, I have entitled this uh, Holistic Remedies or 
hopeful hoaxes, and I think by now people can be suspicious enough of, uh, you know, green tea, red wine, dark chocolate. You've heard it all before, and so there are reasons why some of these things are effective and some of these things are not. But this slide is just sort of a summary of what you've been hearing about for the last 15 or 20 years. And on the bottom, I, I'm going to you know, use these two keywords a few times now. Um, the question is, are these things you're eating or taking, these supplements, are they bioavailable? In other words, do they absorb through your gastrointestinal tract and get into your circulation, into your blood? And do the chemicals in the supplements get to the organs and tissues they're supposed to go or not? And are they effective? Uh, you know, is there efficacy? And finally, is there, you know, if you're interested in dementia and cognitive decline, um, is there blood-brain barrier permeability? Are you taking something that actually gets to your brain? If it does not get to your brain, it's not doing anything to protect your brain. So I'm going to quickly give, you know, my best um, information and recommendations, but what I've learned is the best supplements, in my opinion, are supplements that are already in the food chain. And so on this slide, I'm showing chemical structures of um, what are called carotenoids, and you'll recognize carotene and lycopene. Lycopene's from tomatoes and carotene's from carrots. And because they're, they've, they're so abundant in these vegetables, they've been studied extensively in laboratories and people have learned a lot about them. But in any sort of clinical trials, they haven't seemed very effective at fighting age-related disease or these syndrome diseases, even though you'd think they would be good antioxidants. And one of the reasons is, is that these are the parent structures, the parent chemicals of other antioxidants that are, I believe, truly the nutritious antioxidants. And th those are the ones at the bottom of the list, uh, zeaxanthin and astaxanthin. And I'm an organic chemist, so I'm looking at structures, and I don't expect you to understand exactly what's going on. But as you go from top to bottom, you can see the bottoms are structures are more oxygenated. And, and this structural change is very important for bioavailability and efficacy. Uh, and so what I'm going to point out in the next couple of slides is that these two particular compounds are truly the bioavailable antioxidants, I think, that people should be thinking about. One of them was astaxanthin. It's found in red salmon, uh, particularly in the wild sockeye salmon. Um, and if you go from right to left on this slide, um, astaxanthin, the chemical, is synthesized in marine algae. Uh, algae that's out there floating around in the ocean. It turns from blue-green blue to red, and when it's red, it's filled with this compound called astaxanthin. And these little uh, shrimp called krill eat the algae in the ocean, and the krill themselves pick up this reddish-orange pigment. And when the salmon go out to the ocean to feed, they're going after these swarms of these sh little shrimp called krill. So as you know, the nice wild red sockeye salmon, you know, some lucky bears get to eat them and some lucky humans. But salmon contains this, what I believe is the most bioavailable antioxidant on earth. And it also has the highest levels of the omega-3 fish oils that your doctor tells you to take. So red salmon is likely the true superfood, especially when it comes to uh, cognitive decline and perhaps Alzheimer's disease because this compound is expected to and in some cases studied and known to get into the brain. So I highly recommend, you know, this bright red salmon, sockeye salmon, as one of the best foods you can eat. Uh, this is another graphic showing astaxanthin sitting perfectly in alignment with the molecules that are in cell membranes and mitochondrial membranes. So see, that th these compounds have been brought into our food chain for exactly this reason. Our bodies don't make them, but we need them to be residing in our tissues, in our cells, to maintain the level of oxidative stress that's, um, it begins inside the cells. And if it gets out of control, then it can damage the cells. These antioxidants are sitting right where they need to be. Once you take them by mouth, they get absorbed into your liver, into your vasculature, into your heart, and they sit in the cell membranes perfectly, and they keep the level of oxidative stress low. And so these really, seem to be, I think, effective against age-related disease. So the problem is, since 1960, we've all been experiments of the food industry um, because the focus that the food industry has has been on shelf life, essentially. They want to make tasty things that are kind of nutritious and they don't go bad when you put them in trucks and put them in grocery stores. So of course, they've used all this processed sugar, white flour, processed meats, animal fats, and hydrogenated vegetable oil, trans fats, and high fructose corn syrup. All of the good nutritious stuff has been removed because if you have good nutritious stuff in food, it tends to go bad. It has a bad shelf life. So there's been very little attention paid to the nutrition and the supply of whole foods. So supplements are great, but whole foods are better. You can 
go to your market and you can get red sockeye salmon. It's a little expensive, but you can get it in a can. You can get it as lox if you want. Green kale contains the zeaxanthin, so it's sort of the vegetarian um, source of these good bioavailable antioxidants. I would eat both red salmon and green kale, and I do. If you want to get a supplement, fish oil is great. And up in the right hand, on the right-hand side there, I show fish oil is the pale yellow capsule. Salmon oil or krill oil you can also get is deeper orange or red because it contains much more good stuff. So salmon oil or krill oil would be better for age-related disease than your um, standard salmon oil, which is fairly colorless. I wrote an article uh, in a local magazine here. Um, it's called Food for Thought, and it summarizes everything I was just telling you about, and it focuses on bioavailability and blood-brain barrier permeability of certain nutrients. And um, I can certainly email this to anybody who's interested. Uh, and then the other article that I wrote is more focused on Alzheimer's disease, and it's called A Fine Time to Panic, and I'm, I'm pretty much describing the sort of sorry state of affairs in Alzheimer's drug development right now, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that right now. So this is leading into my update on what's going on in Alzheimer's disease. And, uh, you know, we've talked about this already, increasing longevity and in chronic diseases of aging, but um, you've heard the numbers probably before. People say there's about a 10% chance of having Alzheimer's disease at age 65, about 50% at age 85 and older. And in theory, if we were to live to be 140 years old, uh, certain of my closest colleagues would say that 100% of us would have Alzheimer's disease by the age of 140. So it's not specific to certain people as much as it is part of human brain development and, and, and getting older and older. Uh, there are currently 14 million AD patients worldwide and thinking about 45 million uh, by the middle of the century. So here's some things that people always ask me and I have to answer and I, these are the answers I'm sticking with. As I said earlier, Alzheimer's disease is not a disease of memory loss. It's a disease of neurodegeneration. Um, memory loss is just one of the earliest symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Um, Alzheimer's disease disables cognitive and physical function ultimately, and you will end up, uh, if you survive long enough, in a wheelchair and bed. Um, and you must choose for or against life support, a very important end-of-life question right now. Alzheimer's disease is not genetically inherited. It is sporadic. Now, people will disagree, and I know everyone can go on the Internet and see how many people are studying the genetic component of Alzheimer's disease, but these are gene markers, not genetic inheritance. If Alzheimer's disease was genetically inherited, that would be obvious in our families. There are 1% of the cases called familial Alzheimer's disease where people get Alzheimer's disease in their 50s even, and um, that is genetically inherited to a certain extent, and people are well aware of the families that already have that. So the current Alzheimer's drugs are palliative. They just take care of the symptoms of, say, cognitive impairment, but they do not treat the mechanistic neurodegeneration that's the you know, at the basis of the disease, at the base of the disease. So here are the Alzheimer's disease cognition-enhancing drugs. You'll recognize the names, Aricept, Exelon, uh, Cognex or Tacrin, Mamantine or Namenda, and your you know, your family doctor knows what's out there, and they'll often try one or more of these over time and see which, which works best. But there is no um, sort of, uh, it seems to change from person to person as what combination of these drugs is most effective. And the time window for them being effective is relatively short. Some people say it's two to three years, and it's hard to say when is best to start um, taking them and, and when they'll lose their effect. But you hear different reports, and doctors will just try different drugs or a combination of these. Okay, here's the news about new drug candidates, and these I would call, these are attempts at disease-modifying drugs, drugs that might stop Alzheimer's disease at its mechanism of action. And you can see four drug candidates and four companies here, and um, unfortunately all four of these have failed in late-stage clinical trials in the last three years. And so where someone like me would usually sit up here and say, well, there's probably five years until a new drug candidate, and now I have to say there's probably 10 years until a new drug candidate. So that's the sort of situation that we're in. <clears throat> um, there have been great advancements in new brain imaging methods, and you've probably heard of MRI and CAT scan and PET imaging, and these, this is great science, and you can see a lot about brain activity and brain structure from these. 
Um, however, there is great debate as to whether they are at all diagnostic, and they're certainly not therapeutic. But if you want to look at them as a diagnosis, uh, and that's fine with me, um, the problem is after you uh, get the diagnosis, this does create, as I say here, a painful irony for the Alzheimer's disease patient and their family as there is no effective medication. So these are just sort of, uh, I guess you'd call them editorial comments. That's why I put my initials underneath them. But uh, you know, there's no such thing as gene therapy or stem cell therapy or antisense therapy yet. I mean, there never was. And since the mid-'80s, people have been using these terms. And they always do seem in the articles to say these are likely the future treatments of Alzheimer's disease. And unfortunately, there, aren't, there is none. You know? So I hope that people aren't feeling satisfied that this is enough moving forward. It's really not. Um, and this is, again, my finishing statement to this. You know, chronic brain disease, uh, orally delivered medications, pills and capsules have great advantage over cellular therapy or device-related therapy because those would require brain surgery in patients often over 70 or 75 years old. It's really an untenable course of treatment for an elderly patient population. So we need uh, an orally administered pill or capsule to deal with neurodegeneration. And that's my goal, and that's what I, I work on, it, both in the pharmaceutical industry and on the campus in Camarillo. And, and what we're essentially looking for, and I'm going to come back to these keywords again, are pills or capsules, chemicals that are potentially orally bioavailable and blood-brain barrier permeable, drugs that could get into your circulation and ultimately into your brain so they could stem, inhibit, prevent neurodegeneration. And that's really what everyone is working on right now. And that's our approach um, at the Alzheimer's Institute where I work and also at the big pharmaceutical companies, drugs to prevent neurodegeneration or drugs to stimulate neuroregeneration or neurogenesis. Um, uh, I'm just describing the institute a little bit here, but it was developed to cause everyone on campus to maybe focus a little bit more on Alzheimer's disease research and also provide content for fundraising. It's not easy for us on a campus to raise money for organic chemistry. But if organic chemistry and biology is working together for Alzheimer's drug development, then people get interested. And the result was we got some money from small companies that wanted to work with us. They can write an agreement with the university and people share in whatever good comes out of this. But by 2007, we had, for our annual budget, $241,000 a year. And that goes up and down. Currently, it's down because of the slowed economy. But we still give out, we give out two annual $3,000 scholarships a year. And we've already given out um, eight of those. We've also awarded 25 $3,000 student research assistantships. So that's very uh, kind of a nice accomplishment on campus. And uh, also, um, I just this is a little bit about the approach we use. We start from plant oils, but we make unnatural chemical compounds from the plant oils, particularly trying to get things that would be permeable through the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and that's a part of our goal always. And as I said, we're working to, um, s to prevent neurodegeneration or stimulate neurogenesis, neuroregeneration. And we work with two professors on campus, particularly in chemistry, Professor Hampton, and in biology, Professor Wong. And so we're making unnatural new drug leads from natural sources. Uh, we don't go to the rainforest or anything like that. We use very available plant oils, get them in a kilogram at a time. A couple of examples are ginger oil and turmeric oil. But we're making new compounds from those, not natural ones, because we need to be able to write up patent applications, make uh, chemical compounds that are very interesting to the pharmaceutical industry, because ultimately they want to make a big business out of it. And that's one way to drive this forward faster and faster. So uh, ginger oil is one of the things we use. And ginger oil has a lot of medicinal purposes, but dementia and Alzheimer's disease is not one of them. What we do is convert all the chemical compounds in ginger oil to new uh, chemical compounds that are central nervous system drug-like. In other words, things that can get into the, into the brain and potentially treat neurodegeneration. Uh, turmeric oil was the second example, so I just wanted to show you that. Turmeric is one of those things that I think is really great, uh, new, uh, containing nutrients to stem age-related disease. You can buy a bottle of that at the Bonds or the Ralphs. It's always the bright yellow stuff in the bottle. This is just data that shows that we actually came up with compounds that inhibited an enzyme in the brain called secretase. We inhibit the production of beta amyloid in the brain. That 
amyloid is the stuff that leads to the placking in Alzheimer's disease. So it's believed that if you can slow down the production of amyloid, you can slow down the placking and the nerve damage. So that was one of the projects we were working on. And I'll just go through these very quickly. These are our publications. So this is progress towards these inhibitors of amyloid. Uh, this is design of curcumin analogs, the compound that's in turmeric. And so we had uh, faculty and students working on this. Um, here is another uh, paper that we wrote about blood-brain barrier permeability. So our group on campus in Camarillo is now one of the relative expert, experts in blood-brain barrier permeability. And we study stem cell differentiation on campus in Camarillo. And this is all very exciting because what this is is students and faculty from Ventura County, from Thousand Oaks, Newbury Park, Oxnard, Ventura, working on human neural stem cells right in Camarillo. So I think people should feel pretty proud of that. This is a patent application. Uh, this patent w has published and has been issued uh, with all students and my name on it. And this is our um, recent publication on blood-brain barrier permeability. Neurogenesis, again, all happening with students in Camarillo. This is my critique of the pharmaceutical industry that published back in 2005. Here's our institute featured on uh, the celebration of excellence on campus uh, uh, last year. Um, so we're really become a part of the campus, essentially. Um, and these are a lot of my students, people who I would just like to thank, and other faculty who have been involved, um, particularly Professor Hampton, Professor Wong, and prof uh, the president of the university, um, Richard Rush. He's been very supportive of us as well. And just wanted to, uh, again, show some of our uh, happy researcher students. And then I'll stop with this uh, slide that has my email contact information on it if you want to continue this discussion or if you have any questions for me. And thank you again for inviting me to be part of this. Dr. Rishton, thank you so much. That was really informative and interesting. That was great. And just so you know, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the panel, so uh, you will have an opportunity. So now I want to introduce you again to Dr. Stephen Rusak. He's been the Chief of Continuing Care and Geriatrics for Kaiser Woodland Hills Medical for three years. He was the Director for Geriatric Assessment for the Kaiser Thousand Oaks Clinic for 10 years. He went to medical school at the University of California, San Francisco, and he did his internal medicine residency at UCLA. So Dr. Rusak, I have an elderly neighbor who I used to have a great relationship with. I'd see her on the street. She'd say hello. Everything was great. And then she started getting a little bit more than forgetful. And most recently, her behavior has been quite bizarre. Like she's accused me of stealing her garbage and things like that. And she's alone. So I just wonder, if you suspect someone might have Alzheimer's, what would you suggest they do? Well, first thing you would want to do, and you brought up two important points. One is that you're seeing some changes in thinking and memory. Um, but you're also seeing changes in behavior, and an important thing, too, is if it's impacting her everyday ability to function. And if you're seeing those things, then you want to obviously bring it to the attention of her physician. Most of the time, it'll be her primary care doctor, um, but um, ultimately, um, she should be seen by someone who specializes in geriatrics and, and or neurology in order to uh, you know, make a diagnosis. Um, there's a lot of things that can cause that besides Alzheimer's, and you want to rule those things out. So could you tell us the most recent developments on diagnosis and treatment? Sure. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me, um, the Council on Aging and Senior Concerns. Um, what I wanted to focus on um, a bit was um, some of the more clinical aspects of dementia and Alzheimer's disease, talk a little bit about the what we call the pathophysiology or actually how the disease um, uh, comes to be, Dr. Rishan alluded to the beta amyloid, which is kind of the center of uh, what we what we think one of the things we think causes Alzheimer's. Um, so amplify that a little bit. Also, um, the uh, there's been some new definitions of Alzheimer's uh, and dementia that have uh, you know been put been put forth recently by the National Institute of Aging and the Alzheimer's Association. And then um, people always have questions about the genetics uh, of Alzheimer's as well, so I thought I'd talk a little bit, uh, little bit about that and tell you what I do in the uh, geriatric clinic over at uh, Kaiser and Thousand Oaks. So I put this cartoon up. Um, uh, if you can't read the bottom. It says, the test results are in, you are old. And 
Just for two reasons. One is um, you know, I'll talk a little bit about the new tests and what we call biomarkers that have come about. Um, but just to remind everybody that you know, tests aren't the be-all and end-all. And sometimes we, have, we always have to ask why are we ordering certain tests and what will we do with the information. Um, and a lot of times the other thing is that people come in worried about their memory, dementia, Alzheimer's. And you know, fortunately, a lot of times it doesn't turn out to be Alzheimer's, um, even though we do test some things. And, um, so, just, uh, um, so Alzheimer's disease uh, is the most common form of dementia, and I'll go ahead and define what dementia is in a little bit. There's about 5.5 million cases currently in the United States, uh, projected to about 16 million in 2050, and anywhere from 15 to 17 million worldwide currently. Um, after the age of 80, at least a third of us you know, will, uh, will have Alzheimer's disease. After the age of 85, it's about 40 to 45 percent. Um, but people are in different stages, so you, you don't always, you're not always aware of it. Um, and uh, people always ask me, families and patients, once a diagnosis is made, what's my prognosis? Or, and generally, after a diagnosis is made, um, a person usually lives about three to nine years, depending on you know, their stage and, and when the diagnosis is made. Um, the most important risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is age. As we get older, we're more likely to, to have it. Um, that's the most important number one uh, risk factor for Alzheimer's. Um, this is a, a graph, and basically just it's just to show kind of the trajectory of the disease. You know, um, you can't read the bottom, but they're just uh, years and the amount of money that's that's basically uh, uh, being spent um, overall in treating uh, Alzheimer's disease patients, and just projected to increase, you know, exponentially like that. Um, and of course, it's a is a big part of the uh, Medicare budget, um, and you know Medicare is always in the news now because of the uh, aging of our population and the uh, increase. And so, if we could do anything at all to uh, affect this trajectory, so to speak, a medication um, that can uh, modify the disease or cure it, um, cure is obviously uh, um, you know not not likely soon, but um, to modify the disease is where we're kind of focusing. Then we could try and change that trajectory. Right, right now, we don't have anything like that, but that's kind of the thinking. Um, so the future, basically, if we could have something that we could intervene and change the, uh, uh, slow down the, uh, the disease process, um, by even five years, we'd reduce the number of Alzheimer's patients by over 50 percent and decrease, obviously, the cost, uh, especially with uh, Medicare, by, uh, by a half. Um, and the thinking, the more future thinking is that um, we could develop screening techniques and screening tools that um, we can pick up this disease earlier, uh, even before symptoms show up, such as we've done with cardiac disease and cancer. Um, you know, we know that uh, we don't want to wait till someone's arteries become completely clogged and they have a heart attack. We have screening tools now, check the cholesterol, different blood pressure, things like that. The difference with um, Alzheimer's disease is we do not yet have the medicine available to you know, change the course of the disease like we have with cholesterol medicines. And so that's, that's, where, the, the, that's where the future is. So Alzheimer's disease is a, is a continuum. And this builds on the National Institute of Health, uh, National Institute of Aging, and the Alzheimer's Association. Um, and basically, think of it as a continuum. I mean, someone doesn't just wake up one morning and all of a sudden, you know, they have Alzheimer's. There's, there's what's called a preclinical phase, and the preclinical phase is 10 to 20 years before uh, anybody has any symptoms at all. Um, and this is where screening would be helpful, um, new screening tools. Um, currently, this is not considered uh, useful in clinical practice because we don't have the tools yet refined well enough and we don't have medication to um, change the course of disease, but this is very useful for research, like uh, what Dr. Rishan is doing. If we give him a tool, um, you know, so that he can uh, know if his medicine is actually changing the, the pathophysiology of the disease, that helps him. Then there's mild cognitive impairment, and mild cognitive impairment uh, is a stage where you do notice uh, someone, either they notice or their family notices that there are changes in memory or different things I'll describe, but it's not yet interfering with your ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis or work, if you're still working. Um, so you're still able to function normally, um, but your memory and your thinking abilities are not quite what they should be for someone your age. And then there's possible or probable Alzheimer's dementia, and we'll use possible and probable. I'll define that better, but 
the only way to make a for sure 100% diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease is a brain biopsy, which not many people consent to. So we're in possible and probable, usually. Um, so now, the, the definition of dementia, and there's a lot of writing, I'll, I'll kind of summarize it, but the National Institute of Aging and Alzheimer's Association recently revised the criteria. Um, and not all of it's new, there's just a few new things, but basically what you have to remember is for dementia, the diagnosis of dementia is where someone has an impairment of uh, cognitive and behavioral symptoms. And we, call, we break them down to what we call cognitive domains, the way your brain you know, works. And you have to have impairment in, in at least two of these, okay? Um, the first is impaired ability to remember new information, okay? Um, that's the most common, that's the most common thing that uh, we, we all know uh, associated with Alzheimer's disease. You know, forgetting uh, names, forgetting appointments, um, being repetitive, forgetting recent conversations, misplacing things. That's the kind of stereotype. Um, one of the big changes now with the, the definition, well, I'll, I'll talk about with Alzheimer's, is that does not need to be a primary feature anymore, whereas it has up to this point. Um, the other domains include language. You'll find people that have word-finding problems and uh, difficulty completing sentences, completing their train of thought, um, and, and writing problems. And then there's the other, another domain is called visual spatial skills or tasks. And that's the way your brain sees things kind of in relation to other things. And people can have uh, impairment in that as well, getting lost while driving, difficulty operating familiar objects like remote controls and microwave ovens and washers and dryers, which they usually were able to. Uh, or if they get a new one, then, you know, they have to call, call their son or daughter to come show them how to use it. And, and so that's another domain. Um, a, another domain is impaired reasoning or complex, you know, tasks. Um, these are things that uh, involve judgment, either financial decisions, taking your medications properly, um, and other decisions. And then lastly is personality changes, like, uh, like you were mentioning. Someone becomes more irritable or more withdrawn fluctuations in their moods. So it's not enough just to have memory impairment. You have to have, in, in addition, at least one other domain involved. And then the real important thing, which I always emphasize, is number two. It has to interfere, again, with your ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis. Everyone walks into a room and forgets why they walked into the room or misplaces their keys once in a while. Or, you know, but if these things are happening on a real consistent basis and interfering with your ability to function, um, you know, I had a patient recently who parked his car in the parking lot at the Oaks Mall, came out, couldn't find it, called his daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law came through, came, came by, took him in the car, couldn't find it anywhere, went with a security guard, couldn't find the car, had to come back the next day when all the cars were gone, and then could finally find his car. It happened three times. So, you know, that's a red flag, okay? It's, it's not just coming out and forgetting your car and ten minutes later you find it. So things like that. Um, we have patients that don't show up for appointments on a regular basis, which is a red flag, and you know we, we try to figure out why. Um, or if we see inappropriate uh, prescription refills, you know these patterns is what you're looking for. Um, you also have to have a decline from your previous level of function, and it can't be explained by other sources. What we call a delirium. People can have a, an abrupt change in their thinking ability or confusion from medications or infections or lots of different things. Or someone can have a profound depression or anxiety problem, and that can cause this too. I've seen a number of patients that get referred to me in geriatric clinic, and the primary care doctor, you know, for all the world feels that this is most likely uh, Alzheimer's. Turns out they're profoundly depressed. We put them on an antidepressant, and their memory gets much better. And it turns out it wasn't uh, dementia to begin with. So we make a diagnosis through clinical exam, through laboratory testing, and through imaging, such as MRIs, sometimes PET scans. But mostly it's a clinical, a clinical diagnosis at this point. Um, now, we, call, we, we use the term um, in Alzheimer's disease, probable Alzheimer's dementia. That's where you meet the criteria, what I just described. And we can definitely document a pattern over months to years. This isn't something that happened a few days or weeks. It's months to years. And we have corroborating evidence of that, either a family member, a caregiver, a friend. Um, the most common presentation is what we call amnestic. And I'll just throw these terms out because you're going to read about and hear about these things. Amnestic means memory, memory loss, you know. And that's when I was saying that that's the most common presentation. But at this point, it's not a, an essential presentation to diagnose Alzheimer's anymore. Um, and you also want to make sure there are no other kinds of dementia, which I'll, I'll talk about in a, in a little bit. So that's probable Alzheimer's. Fits the pattern, and you can document a gradual um, um, decline. 
Um, possible Alzheimer's uh, basically meets the uh, criteria um, also, but there's, the history you're getting is more of a sudden onset, or you don't have someone to corroborate a gradual decline. There may well have definitely been a gradual decline, but you don't have a family member or somebody there to, to, to corroborate that. Um, and also, if someone has concurrent um, what we call cerebral vascular disease, that means someone has, um, as you can get blood, uh, you can get uh, blockages in the arteries in the heart, you can get the same thing happening in the arteries in the brain, which leads to stroke or mini strokes or uh, TIAs or, or regular strokes, or even what we call microvascular disease, where you don't have a definite stroke, but a lot of areas where the blood flow is compromised. So if you do an MRI or a CAT scan and you see a lot of that, um, but the pattern seems like Alzheimer's, then you can say it's possible Alzheimer's. Okay. Then there's mild cognitive impairment. And mild cognitive impairment, like I was describing, is where you have the cognitive problems, but it's not interfering with your everyday function. You're still able to function. Uh, you're still able to work. And, and uh, um, currently, we don't have any medications to treat this. Uh, as of a few years ago, um, I was using um, the cognitive enhancers, uh, which I'll describe um, uh, in this stage, because the feeling in the literature was, why wait? Let's start early, and maybe we can slow down the disease progression. But as of a few years ago, studies, more recent studies, don't pan that out, don't show that. And so the medicines weren't really useful at this stage. And they can have side effects, so we really don't use them at this stage anymore. Um, Preclinical Alzheimer's, what I was saying is that you don't have any symptoms at all. This is 10 to 20 years before anything, but there's changes in the brain already going on. And that's where these biomarkers uh, come in, which I'll talk about. Um, and this is really uh, useful in a research setting. Now, some of the other dementias you may hear about, um, uh, one called the vascular dementia. This is due to um, the strokes I told you about, multiple strokes or, uh, or a big stroke. Someone may have a, a real decline in their cognitive function after a big stroke. Um, and we often find this on, on imaging studies. Um, that accounts for about maybe 10 to 15% of dementias. Uh, frontotemporal dementia um, affects more of the frontal lobes of the brain as opposed to the parietal temporal lobes with Alzheimer's. And you'll, you'll see personality changes are a hallmark of this. If someone becomes disinhibited, doing an inappropriate thing socially, um, you know, this is a stereotype is someone blurts out a, you know, a, a word they shouldn't in the middle of like a room like this, or you know, then you start to worry about that kind of dementia. And, and interestingly enough, you don't see it. The, the memory issues are not as profound with that. Um, Lewy body dementia um, has to do with deposition of these other kind of proteins um, we call Lewy bodies in the neuron, and you, you, you typically will get hallucinations with that, and you'll get. Um, uh, interestingly enough, it'll look like Parkinson's disease. A lot of times you'll see, you know, the tremor and the slowness and the rigidity you'll see with Parkinson's along with hallucinations with Lewy body dementia. Lewy body dementia is unfortunately very usually a rapid course or life expectancy is usually 6 to 12 months with that. And the more we're learning about Alzheimer's and dementia in general, the more we're kind of realizing that uh, to have pure this or pure that is not as frequent as having kind of combinations of these. Alzheimer's and vascular dementia are very common. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's dementia is another one, you know, very common. Now, as far as biomarkers, um, biomarkers are uh, uh, ways of uh, kind of imaging or, or tests that we can do in order to try and predict the disease or predict what's going to happen, predict the diagnosis. So obviously you want the biomarkers to be accurate um, and to be standardized. Um, and this helps increase the certainty that you're making the right diagnosis and hopefully to, to screen early for it. As of this time, these are not recommended for routine clinical use uh, for a number of reasons. One is um, we have good clinical accuracy just using our own uh, physical exam tools, history, and laboratory tests. Um, to make the diagnosis in, of Alzheimer's about 80 to 90 percent accuracy. Um, the other is that there's limited standardization. You can go from one lab to the next, um, one imaging um, uh, place to another, and you'll get different readings depending on who's reading it or uh, what machine is being used. Um, access is limited to these. These are primarily used in uh, university settings for research. And so your standard family doctor, primary care clinic, or even neurologist is not going to have access to all of these. Um, and, uh, but they're, you know, useful in clinical trials now and, and in research. So kind of the, the uh, main player in this is the neuron, and, 
And the neuron is the uh, cell in the brain, which you have billions of. And it's hard to see, but on the bottom right of that, you can see where one neuron is coming in contact with another neuron um, through these dendrites, and we call it synapses. There's a little tiny space between there, and chemicals are uh, present in this little space called neurotransmitters. And when the neuron gets a signal and wants to talk to the other neuron, it secretes these neurotransmitters, and that's how the nerves talk to each other. So that's basically um, um, how, how that works. Um, now, beta amyloid you'll hear a lot about. This is the uh, kind of the central player in, in Alzheimer's, and beta amyloid is a protein. Um, it comes from, in the, in the left, bottom left picture, there's that big blue kind of spirally, it's a protein, and we call it the amyloid precursor protein. And that's a normally occurring uh, protein that occurs in the membranes. Um, and then in the picture on the top right, you'll see, if you can see, there's two little scissors. And uh, those scissors are there to demonstrate enzymes. Enzymes are proteins in our body that modify, I mean, our, yeah, proteins in our body that modify things. And um, you can think of these enzymes as cutting this precursor protein into fragments. And normally it cuts it into a fragment. Your uh, body can you know, get rid of the fragment the way it's supposed to. But in Alzheimer's disease, you get an accumulation of an abnormal fragment. And this accumulation occurs then in, in these plaques. If you look under the microscope, you'll see these plaques between the neurons. And it comes from, uh, in part, these enzymes malfunctioning and cutting the protein in the wrong place. In the genetic, uh, one of the genetic, uh, one of the um, um, uh, Alzheimer's, in the early onset Alzheimer's you see in the 40s and 50s, um, you definitely have genetic mutations to these enzymes, and uh, that's been shown. But again, that's 1 or 2% of the cases. Um, the other um, hallmark of this disease involves what we call tau protein. And tau protein is a protein that's on the microtubules on the, the neuron, and it helps in providing nutri nutrition to the neurons. And um, there, uh, you have an abnormality in the tau protein, which causes the neuron to malfunction, and the neuron leads to the death or the de degeneration of the neuron. So you'll hear about plaques, and you'll hear about tangles. The tangles have to do with the tau protein. When it's abnormally phosphorylated, it causes uh, abnormal changes, and you get what look like under the microscope these tangles, you know, uh, in the neuron itself. So now going back to those biomarkers, um, there are five biomarkers that, um, that uh, have been focused on uh, and uh, standardized the best. Um, there are two classes. The first class has to do with the deposition of the amyloid in the brain, measuring that. And then the second, number two, has to do with actually the death or degeneration of the neurons. Um, first is you can measure uh, in the cerebral spinal fluid, which bathes our brain and central nervous system. If you do a lumbar puncture, a spinal tap, and you remove some of the fluid, you can actually measure some of these proteins. And one of them is the beta amyloid, that fragment. And uh, low levels of that are associated with the development of Alzheimer's. Also, um, PET scan, which is a, a type of uh, scan that we can do for the brain, um, uh, especially when if you're injected with a compound that can bind to the amyloid in your brain, we can actually see, you know, 10 to 20 years earlier, hopefully, uh, someone who has a lot more of that than someone else, and we can help predict maybe that they're going to go on to form Alzheimer's. So those are the early kind of biomarkers. The later biomarkers have to do with when the nerve is already dying and degenerating. And that has to do with an elevation of the cerebral spinal fluid, that tau protein, um, has to do with uh, a little bit different kind of PET scan where we actually can see the way the brain uses sugar. Um, the brain uses sugar as an energy source. And in Alzheimer's, if you do a PET scan, you'll see that there's a lot less use of the sugar. Um, and also, if you do an MRI, you can see shrinkage of the brain in certain places. So that's kind of the biomarkers. Again, not all standardized and really more being used in research purposes at this point. So this is a, a kind of a graphic pre representation of what I was trying to say. It's a little bit hard for you guys to see, but um, on the left you have normal aging, and then it progresses as we go to the right. The, all the way to the right is early Alzheimer's, and in the middle is where you have the preclinical or the mild cognitive impairment. And um, as you can see, the, the, the top line is that, that cerebral spinal fluid uh, tau protein, um, and um, as we get farther in the disease course, um, you, you have more abnormalities on imaging studies and on some of these biomarkers. And as those get more prominent, symptoms start showing up. And um, that uh, the second dotted line at the top is where it says dependence on assistance, uh, dependence on assistance in daily activities. 
This is where someone needs help with dressing and bathing and, you know, using the toilet and, you know, very simple stuff. Um, but you can see that it doesn't start going up until we start getting, you know, uh, farther along into early Alzheimer's. And then there's uh, a line, uh, the, the dotted line on the bottom is called neuropsychological test performance. And that's complex testing that can be done to document some of these memory deficiencies and other cognitive uh, problems. And you can see that starts to really decline as we hit early Alzheimer's. So the symptoms are not there early on. You know, we, we know we have 10 to 20 years before we start seeing symptoms. So again, what happens in the brain, you get accumulation of these plaques, these beta amyloid plaques between the neurons, and you get deposition of these uh, uh, neurofibrillary tangles. And the bottom line, just to remember, is that these lead to death of the neuron, um, loss of the synapses, and loss of the neurotransmitters, the way the nerves talk to each other, and then you get the symptoms. So that's kind of the, the, the progression. So these are the medications that, um, that we can use. Um, again, the names will be familiar, Aricept. Um, you may have heard of Galantamine or Razodyne, Rivastigmine or Exelon, and then Nemenda uh, or Mamantine. And uh, again, there's studies don't show any benefits um, uh, between one over the other. They all work about the same. Um, some are indicated for early disease, some are indicated more for later disease. But again, these are just basically uh, trying to, the first three are just trying to restore some of the depletion of the neurotransmitters. So again, it's at the very end, you know. Um, then the Menda works a little differently on a different receptor, uh, preventing overexcitation, um, and we do use them in combinations. Um, studies show that they help probably slow the disease pro process a little bit, maybe six months, 12 months, something like that. They're probably effective for up to two years. And we think that if a person stays on them, then the disease will progress a bit slower. But um, you know, by, by three to five years, um, if people on these drugs are pretty much caught up to if they hadn't taken them to begin with. <clears throat> they do help um, in some of the behavioral issues and behavioral problems that we see, and they do help preserve some of the, your ability to, to do things for yourself, like dressing and walking and that kind of thing. So, so the newer thinking is, again, we know things are happening in the brain 10 to 20 years before symptoms start, um, and dementia is the end stage of many years of this uh, accumulation of these abnormal proteins. And uh, interestingly, 30% of cognitively normal elderly, if you have someone who um, allows themselves to have an autopsy and they've never shown any symptoms of dementia, in 30% uh, um, of cognitively normal elderly have some levels of brain pathology that looks like Alzheimer's. So some of these changes you'll see with aging, um, and uh, you know, so it's the degree that we see it, basically. Um, so when beta amyloid, that protein gets de deposited, we think that's the first thing that happens in more of a preclinical phase, and the tangles and tau protein problems appear just before symptoms start. And, but both processes lead to the, to the death or degeneration of the, of the nerve cell. Now, as far as genetics, um, so basically there are two forms. Um, there's the, the sporadic uh, form of Alzheimer's, which is by far and away the most common type. Um, and then there's the early onset, or familial. And again, the early onset is very rare. One to 2% of, of uh, uh, people that have Alzheimer's get that. Onset is early on, 40s and 50s. You'll see it running through families. And that there's a definite association with a, a genetic mutation in that precursor protein and in those enzymes. Um, then, uh, but the vast majority is, is sporadic uh, uh, cases. And the genetics of that are not well worked out at all. Uh, there's not a genetic, I mean, there's not a clear cut like, you know, brown eyes and blue hair, blue, <laughs> blue eyes and brown hair. Um, but, uh, uh, but there is some genetic component, but it's just not well worked out yet at all. Um, and 25% of patients with this late onset uh, disease uh, will have a close relative uh, with dementia. So when I do get a family history of dementia, that is important. I do note that, and there is an increased risk, but I can't tell the person, you know, exactly, you know, how, how much increased risk. Um, and um, there's something you'll hear about called the APOE4 gene, and that's a gene that codes for a, um, uh, a transport system within our body that transports cholesterol around. And the E4 is a specific type of that. And people that have two copies of that have a higher incidence of Alzheimer's, three to four times. Um, probably has to do with some derangement in the way our body transports cholesterol around, which is very important for the membranes. Um, but there's about a three or four incre uh, times increased risk. 
patients that develop Alzheimer's that have this gene, um, they have a, a bit of an earlier onset and um, um, they uh, may progress a bit faster. Um, so I always get asked, so should I have this test to test for this gene? Um, you know, in someone who doesn't necessarily get diagnosed yet, but someone early on. And the answer, not just for me, but in the literature by all experts is no. Um, the reason why is, again, we don't have, if you find this, um, and then the person you know, knows they have a three to four times increased risk, we don't have medicines to alter the disease process yet. Um, and um, you know, then you're just worried, am I gonna develop Alzheimer's? And there's five or six other genes at least involved that, uh, with this process. So you know, the vast majority of people with this won't develop Alzheimer's. Um, and then if, this, if you do get this tested and an insurance company finds out, they could say, well, you're at increased risk, you know, maybe they'll raise your rates or something. So right now it's not recommended to do genetic testing unless you're in a family with early onset Alzheimer's. And then it would be obviously probably appropriate. Um, and interestingly enough, a lot of the genetic mutations that have been associated are on chromosome 21, which is the same one that uh, is involved with Down syndrome. You see a much higher incidence of Alzheimer's with Down syndrome. Um, but there are many other pro chromosomes, 9, 10, 12, 19, which are uh, also um, probably involved. Uh, and multiple, multiple mutations with the, uh, with the tau protein. So the bottom line with genetics is it's not well worked out in, in the vast majority of cases and don't get the genetic testing. Uh, so current research, um, again, looking at uh, inhibitors of those enzymes, um, inhibitors of the amyloid deposition. Um, there's ongoing trials now that are, are, are interesting with a vaccination against amyloid. Um, the first, first few trials with the vaccination were not successful, lots of side effects, but a more purified um, a derivative is being tested now. Um, and, um, and also using antibodies. Um, what we do in the geriatric clinic over at Kaiser and Thousand Oaks and at Woodland Hills is we have a, a geriatric assessment clinic. So um, primary care doctors, family practice and internal medicine doctors, um, and anybody really you know, that has a question can refer their patients to us. And I have a, a team um, that we do uh, initial consultations and we follow patients over time. Um, and the, the, uh, the assessment involves a, a, a thorough history and physical examination, checking family history, um, uh, assessing other medical illnesses, going through a comprehensive um, evaluation of a patient's medicines, uh, doing formal cognitive testing. There are certain scales that, that uh, we use in order to measure someone's uh, performance cognitively, thinking-wise. Um, assessment of a, a person's ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, very important assessing for depression and anxiety. Um, then we will also do laboratories and, and imaging um, as appropriate. Um, and very important thing too is talking about driving. Driving is always a very touchy issue, especially with men in Southern California. Um, but um, it, it needs to be discussed. And um, you know, and there are lots of. I had one patient where um, we did our initial consultation, and it was obvious the the gentleman had Alzheimer's disease, and. Uh, the wife and, and his wife had come along, and uh, I was discussing with him driving, and he, you know, was very, very uh, argumentative. I'm a good driver. I've never had an accident. I've never, you know, this or that. And I explained to him that by uh, law, I need to report you to the public health department for a formal test by the DMV. Um, we never take away your license. The DMV always does a, a, an eval. And the, and the patient's wife was very argumentative with me and, and said, how dare you do this? This is not appropriate. We never would have come for this. And, and then, uh, so we were done, and they were leaving the room, and the husband leaves the room, and the wife stayed behind just a second, and she turns to me and she goes, thank God you talked to him about driving. Thank you so much. You know, she didn't want to be the bad guy, which is totally understandable, um, but she said we were all worried about it, and we thought he would kill himself or kill somebody else. So driving is always something we talk about. Um, and then end-of-life issues, as you alluded to, are very important. Once a diagnosis is made, um, you know, we want to introduce that as well. And I have a team. I have a team, a nurse practitioner, a geriatric pharmacist, a social worker, and a case manager. And uh, the initial consultation is about three hours long. Um, and patients come and they, they get a little bit tired. And I, I say, most people come and they say, we don't spend enough time with them. Here you've got three hours. <laughs> um, but and we follow over time, depending on, uh, on what, what the initial uh, diagnosis is. Um, we make recommendations about medications, um, further testing if needed. Um, Maureen will talk about resources for uh, patients and families. There's also non-pharmacological interventions, which uh, Dr. Rishton talked about, uh, with the krill and uh, fish oil and things like that. Um, and then we do ongoing follow-up. 
Um, so the hope is in the future that by the time symptoms like this develop, where it says on the bottom, the dog died two years ago, Henry, he's throwing a stick for a fetch. Um, but the hope is, is that we can detect this disease uh, appropriately much, much earlier once we have uh, um, standardized our tests and we have medications then that can uh, modify the disease process. Uh, and, and hopefully, you know, this will be a much less common occurrence. Thank you very much, Dr. Essek. That was really great. Okay, next we're going to turn to Senior Concerns' very own Maureen Simons. She's the Director of Programs there. She has a nursing background. She's been the Adult Day um, Director since 2002, and she is our great communicator. Maureen can talk to anybody about anything. So, Maureen... I am right beside your office, and I see, I always know when a family's coming in to talk to you for the first time, because they've been told that their loved one has been diagnosed with dementia, and you see the terror in their eyes as they're walking into your office, and you close the door, and you sit them down, and you talk to them. I know you have to have a lot of hard conversations, but you also give them a lot of reassurance. So what does that conversation usually sound like? How does that usually go? Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. And to follow these guys with this, I'm going, oh, dear. <laughs> Can't remember all this stuff. Um, the conversation I like to have with the family before they ever come into the center, because coming into the center can be a very daunting experience for families. They um, look around and think, I'm not like that, or my mom's not like that, or my husband's not like that. They're not that old. So I like to have a conversation with the family over the phone. And from that, I can kind of get a feel for which kind of program they're going to fit into, because at Senior Concerns, we have three levels of programming. One for people who have, let's say, mild dementia. Some of them have had strokes and just got some other cognitive issues and Parkinson's disease. And then a kind of middle-of-the-road program for people who have a combination. They've, um, they need the staff direction. They need somebody to start the conversation. They need, you know, some direction during the day. But all in all, they can kind of manage fairly well with supervision. And then we have a very uh, unique program within um, Ventura County for people who have really advanced Alzheimer's disease. And I think... Ten years ago, most of the people that are in the program today would have been in a skilled nursing facility. So we have developed our program so that we can keep people at home longer. But if, when I get them, when they come into the program to visit me, I, like, I ask for a diagnosis. I ask if they've been to the doctors, who's referred you? Dr. Russick's team's very on the ball with things like that. So we come in and we start talking about What's affecting them at home? How have things changed at home? Um, and it's enlightening. And it takes me about an hour or so to get a full picture from the caregiver, the family member, a friend, to find out exactly what's going on at home. Because they're very elusive when they come in. Nobody wants to admit that my mother's incontinent or doesn't take her pills or has taken a a one week's worth of pills in at one time because they've had it all labeled out. And so it's, it, and it's really sad. And to hear me say this is, you know, this is where we're going to help you, this can no longer go on. You know, you really need to, I'm going to help you, I'm going to give you resources to, to help you through this journey. And it's, sometimes it's a long journey. I mean, you've got somebody with advanced dementia. It's a very long, tiresome journey. So my first thing is we have a tour of the center. And from the conversation I've had, it's usually I know where not to take them first. So they do not go into, the, um, into our advanced dementia program. We start off at the highest level, and yeah, that's where everybody fits. Everybody. That's where they want to go. Everybody can take care of themselves. So. From that, you know, they, I, I, we do try them at the highest level of, of functioning um, because it's important. On the other hand, it can be very stressful and distressing to someone who 
has been doing a major cover-up for years or months and, and is now out of the confines of the family who are answering questions, who are finishing sentences, who are doing tasks for them, and they're out in the open, and somebody's actually watching them and expecting an answer, and they can't give it. So usually after, after a visit or two, they come out and they, they go, but that conversation starts in my office. But I do give them the benefit of the doubt. That's what the family said. The doctor said, no, they don't have Alzheimer's disease. They just have dementia. Okay, so they've got dementia. Um, but the, I mean, the Alzheimer's disease is very different from the, the frontal lobe dementia. So the, the way we um, plan activities and the expectation of those, you know, the, the participants during those activities are very different. Um, so we, we have to, you know, I like to know a diagnosis because then I know where the behavior is coming from if we actually see behavior. But the families are, usually the men have the hardest time letting go because they made a promise that no, they would never let anybody else do the caregiving. They were going to do it. Women, I think, because they've let children go off to school, they've sent kids off to college, and all the families are that, find it a little easier to let go. And, um, but men, no, it's, I have to drag them out and they, um, they always want to know how I manage during the day. Well, I don't have family history, so whenever somebody comes into the center, it's whatever they've got there and then that day, we judge and make a plan of, of activities and um, what's going to happen to them during the day from that day on. I can't go back. I don't have the memories. So, I forgot to mention that Maureen also uh, is in charge of caregiver support groups, which is not only does it help the caregivers talk with each other, but it also provides respite for the person that they're caring for. So they can either bring the person to the center or in some circumstances, someone will actually go to the home if the person can't go out so that the caregiver can come in for the support group. So we've talked about what happens when you have the first conversation. Then you have the situations where a person's been there for a while and they're starting to go downhill. And there's certain things that you can do to trigger bad behavior, and there's other things that you can do to try to avoid that. So how do you explain those kinds of behaviors with the families? A lot of that is learned at the support group. Um, the, the other people that have walked that walk and talked that talk sometimes are much better at giving advice and and direction to someone who's really dealing with very difficult behavior. At the center, I can, I can guarantee that there's been a trigger for bad behavior and nobody's noticed. So from my vantage point, if anybody's ever been to the center, my office is in the middle of the piano room, which is very noisy. So I get a good view of what's going on during the day. And I can see things develop and I'm out of my office because there's got to be a, an intervention take place. And it, all it takes sometimes is a touch or, you know, a moving to the other room. Things that families don't think about and they're in the face of somebody. You know, as soon as a behavior starts, the, the caregiver behavior escalates as well. So it becomes a battle of wills. And sometimes with people with dementia they're, or Alzheimer's disease, they they're not picking up on the verbal cues. They're watching for body language. They're, they're picking up on those, that energy that you're giving off when you're mad, you know, or you're, the smile on your face is not actually looking like a smile when your body's all tense, and that's what people are picking up on. So it's, it, it's hard for the caregivers to do that. It's much easier for me to pick up on that. It's very difficult for caregivers to to cross that barrier and, or step back and say, take a breath. And that's why the center's there. It's to allow people to either go to work because you're young and you still have to work, or you're a son or a daughter and you're caring for parents, or a spouse, an elderly spouse, who needs a break, who needs to go home and go Phew, all by themselves without somebody saying, what are you doing in there when you go to the bathroom? Asking the same question over and over and over again. There are 10 of us at the center. We can hear that 
question ten times each, and it doesn't make any difference. It, somebody else will pick, come in and pick up. It's teaching the caregiver how to let go, step back, and not get in to the arguing, because you cannot argue with somebody who cannot reason, who has lost that ability. And when you're hanging on to those memories, um, it's hard. And, and sometimes the long-term memory, boy, is so intact, and the families just don't get why. You can talk about what your mother did with you when you were 12, but you can't remember what I did with you this morning. It's, it's really confusing for caregivers. It's very hard work. And for people with the disease to stay up and on all day, which they do at the center, is absolutely exhausting. They go home from my place absolutely worn out. So. And I would like to say for, for those of you who have not been to Senior Concerns, and when I first took this job and my friends were like, oh my gosh, that must be so depressing. It's not. It's joyous. The center is lovely. The participants are fun. The caregivers are amazing. And there's always something amusing going on somewhere around there. So thank you, Maureen. Um, at this time, I would like to open it up to questions. Does anyone have any questions? Dave? Uh, thank you, Brenda. Brenda, first off, um, I know you haven't been around us very long, but to be able to put this kind of panel together is just re remarkable. And, I, and I'm just so happy we have such three wonderful people who are concerned about the uh, care and quality of life of seniors in our, in our community. Thank you. Thank you. And thank uh, a direct question to... Uh, a direct question to Dr. Rishton. Um, you said your office and email is available. Are you looking for input from our senior community in some fashion, either from a clinical trial or just information? Or I guess put that in context, what, would, what we could do. I think from my perspective, I think the most important thing would be to, um, as you have, sort of organize a council on aging, dealing with senior concerns, you know, to use all the names here, but uh, I think raising awareness and advocacy is really the most important thing I could ask of you um, to understand that, you know, if you go back to the mid to late 80s before there were medications for HIV and AIDS, there was a lot of discrimination and stigmatization of HIV and AIDS, and it was slowing down the progress of the science and the drug development, and it took a public outcry and a uh, you know, patient advocates, family and friends outcry, and it took the federal government coming together with the pharmaceutical industry and all of those entities putting pressure on each other to make rapid advances. And it really does come down to sort of a public outcry and advocacy, and that's the biggest thing I could ask of you. Otherwise, my email and my contact information is available to, uh, you know, answer questions about drug development or um, some of the nutritional things I talked about. And when it comes to participation in clinical trials, that would be um, closer to what uh, Steve deals with. And uh, as I said, most of my work is preclinical. Uh, Dr. Rishan, uh, early in your talk, you painted a picture in my mind of uh, a, a world in which we're conquering uh, acute diseases, uh, finding cures for them, uh, and we're beginning to learn to manage the chronic diseases. Uh, and for lack of a better term, put them in remission. Um, and uh, I hope we are in agreement that aging is not a disease. Um, so what, what should we look forward to once we've sort of uh, uh, got a handle on the diseases and they're no longer a problem for us, but we continue to age? Um, mm -hmm. uh, well, it's a little bit philosophical, I guess, but yeah. um, I think my first, um, my first hope is that uh, instead of dealing with the symptoms of age-related diseases. I hope people will start to recognize and that in their 20s and 30s and 40s there are decisions about uh, lifestyle and nutrition that can um, really sort of, you know, sort of, uh, I think, improve your health moving forward. I, I'm trying to remember what I wrote in that magazine article, but I said, uh, yeah, we shouldn't uh, be trying to seek out an instant fountain of youth, but a sustained fountain of good health throughout life. 
age-related disease is, I think, unavoidable. As you said, it now is managed, maybe well managed at this point. But with the proper nutrition and lifestyle, you could be probably on half of the medications that you're on by the time you're 70. Um, and I think that is going to make a huge difference. And you, that falls under preventative care, certainly. But I think, again, it's about awareness and advocacy. When I look at this, this problem of diabetes and obesity, it's so frustrating to me because it can be completely reversed by changing nutrition, nutritional habits. And of course, exercise, but it's, it's something that we could completely change. And I don't know if we're going to get to that point of understanding with cognitive decline and dementia, but I think that is the most important area right now. What can we do for decades before we're elderly? to make sure that we've um, sort of minimized the effect that age-related disease has on our lives. And um, hopefully we get older and older and we have quality of life to go along with it. And that's about as philosophical as I'll get. <laughs> I have a question. And to that point, um, I also needed to mention that Senior Concerns has a brain fitness program. And we actually have a four-week session where people come in and they do an exercise component. They do a yoga class one day a week. It's also a socialization session where they get to know the other participants. They do the Dacom Brain Fitness computer uh, three times a week for 20 to 30 minutes a session. And they also have a nutrition seminar. So those are pretty much uh, ongoing four-week sessions. I have a question. Maureen, uh, let me ask you a quickie about caregivers. Um, I've heard that Caregivers pay a pretty heavy price when dealing with an Alzheimer's patient. Are there statistics that suggest uh, caregivers are in greater danger of a shorter life uh, or not? I mean, do you get my drift? Yeah. Um, I have read about 60% of the caregivers dealing with caregiving people with dementia will die before the person they're caring for. Yes. Um, it's hard work, and they're not always. Dr. Richter and I were talking about it earlier. They're not. We're not, as family, the best caregivers. You cannot possibly be caring for someone 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It takes a toll. It takes a toll on my staff. It takes a toll on on, on caregivers in any setting. But family caregivers are the ones that take the beating. Thank you. Thank you. Harry? I have a question in relation to an earlier question that was asked. Uh, I'm under the impression that instead of following diets or regimens for improving health, that most Americans rather would take a pill to improve their, their lifestyle rather than do what the, the work that's required otherwise. Yes. Uh, well, I, I, you know, maybe I, I wish I, I've thought how many ways you could um, make pills or capsules that contain um, green vegetables and red salmon, you know, and they already are doing it with fish oil. I mean, a pharmaceutical company has developed fish oil as a pharmaceutical now, so it's, it's kind of ridiculous instead of people um, recognizing the benefits of eating fish three times a week, uh, now they have it prescribed to them, but that's how sort of, that's how hesitant or reticent people are to change their lifestyle. Behavior is one of the most difficult things to change uh, in people. Now we'd like to take questions from the audience. Yes, I have a question um, for Dr. Ruzek. Um, it has to do with, uh, if you could comment on the Lewy bodies uh, Alzheimer's. Is it, is it true that you can only diagnose that with uh, an autopsy? No, um, Lewy body and Alzheimer's are separate. They're two different causes of dementia. Um, Lewy body, although you can't get some overlap, Lewy body dementia can be, uh, it's usually diagnosed again clinically, as you'll see a different presentation. Usually hallucinations are more of an initial presentation than Alzheimer's, and you also have some features that look like Parkinson's disease on physical exam. Um, if you do a PET scan, a, brain, a type of a brain scan, um, you may see a different pattern as well. So, um, so no, you don't have to wait for autopsy. Okay, though. thank you. And interestingly enough, I can just say, the medicines that um, 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 uh, we use, we do use similar medicines for Lewy body dementia. The Aricept and those medicines are very helpful. In fact, the antipsychotic medicines that we normally use to treat behavioral problems in Alzheimer's make Lewy body dementia worse. 
usually. Um, so, thank you. I have three questions. The first one's for Dr. Rustin. Is there no hope at all for stem cell research? Uh, that's a great question. The um, controversy that's, you know, been swirling around about stem cells uh, refers to embryonic stem cell research. And, you know, I always say that, you know, something's wrong with the world when the Bush family was disagreeing with the Reagan family about something. The uh, fact is that people have their opinions on how we should use or research um, embryos and embryonic stem cells in particular. So, you know, as a scientist, I always encourage just sort of the, you know, let's maximize the ability of people to research in the laboratories, whether we're talking about embryonic stem cells or whatever. But the other type of stem cells are adult stem cells. Those are stem cells we already have in our own bodies. So each of our organs and tissues uh, have their own particular stem cell, and the stem cells are progenitors for, you know, in your liver you'll have a stem cell that can become a liver cell. And as you age, the activity of these stem cells goes down and down, and in your brain the same thing is true. You have neural stem cells. And so one way to look at this is not to worry about embryonic stem cells, because if you were going to use embryonic stem cells for Alzheimer's disease, you'd likely have to do brain surgery, open the skull, put embryonic stem cells in there and hope that they do what you want them to do. And that, as a scientist, seems unlikely to me, regardless of the ethics and the controversy of embryonic stem cells. So instead, let's try to take the adult stem cells that are already in our brains and activate them with some drug that we might take as a pill or a capsule. So um, some of the work we do on campus, we purposely focused on uh, nutritional antioxidants because they're already in the food chain and let's just see what the effect is on these neural stem cells in the laboratory. So we watch how neural stem cells become um, nerve cells or glia cells, different types of brain cells and the effects of these things. And this is only a laboratory project but at the same time it introduces this idea that it might be much more practical to develop a medicine that stimulates the differentiation of adult stem cells just in terms of the practicality of developing a medicine and regardless of the ethics of it. So I'm trying to get people to think about adult stem cells more than embryonic stem cells. Leave the ethics controversy behind us because everyone can work with adult stem cells, it's no problem, and try to come up with a pill or a capsule as opposed to a surgical procedure. In reality, there are no cellular therapies except for transfusions and transplants. If you want to introduce new cells into your brain, there's no guarantee they're going to create new nerve cells or do anything compatible with your own brain. We haven't really demonstrated that successfully. I made some bad choices. I'm using oxygen. I used to smoke. Uh, is there any demographics uh, that show, say, smokers have a preponderance uh, of uh, Alzheimer's, or has that the study been done on that? Um, I don't know of any direct uh, studies that show a relationship, uh, but definitely smoking leads to pathophysiological changes such as the cerebrovascular disease in the brain, and we know that that does accelerate uh, or is, is associated with more deposition of that protein, that amyloid protein. So indirectly, um, it does cause problems. And the third question I have, the Congress presently is talking about giving vouchers. And if you have any Alzheimer's, that uh, voucher that they're proposing won't even come close to covering it. Will that work? Or? You're talking about vouchers, a, a certain amount of money to That's take care of a person about, with yeah. Alzheimer's? To buy insurance. To buy insurance. Yeah. Well, you're right. I mean, I'm not sure the amount of money they're talking about, but um, we're talking billions and billions of dollars, so probably it wouldn't come close. And um, as Maureen knows, um, um, it, it is very expensive. Caregivers are very expensive. Um, boarding care, assisted living, all these things are very expensive. And Senior Concerns has really been a godsend to our patients. Uh, it's a place where patients can go. It's very economical. Um, and, um, you know, can give the family a, a break um, to the point where well, as the disease progresses further, uh, then they, they do need uh, placement of other things, but the cost is, is uh, very, very high. Joan? I have one question. 
is there a correlation between depression and dementia and or Alzheimer's? Yeah, that's a good question. There is. Um, uh, older people that have depression do have a higher incidence of Alzheimer's disease. Um, again, uh, sometimes it can ask, it can, it can, it can act as, a, you use a term that used to be called pseudo-dementia, where someone would have depression and uh, they would be thought to have Alzheimer's, so we call it pseudo-dementia. We don't really use that term anymore. Um, but uh, yes, people that do have depression do have a higher incidence of Alzheimer's. Thank you. Mrs. Pearson? Dr. Husek, did I understand you right? Once you are an ARSEP 23, it might only be good for two years, and it helps you for two years, and also can you take that in combination with Zoloft? Um, you have to be careful when you're using um, Zoloft or other antidepressants, what are called SSRIs, um, with Aricept. In general, there, there is a, a warning. Uh, you have to be monitored. Um, but we do use uh, other, uh, other SSRIs uh, to treat depression with uh, Alzheimer's. Um, now, the Aricept, yes, generally the studies show a benefit for a, a, about two years or so with those medications. Um, but we don't necessarily stop them at the end of that because um, there's a suggestion that it, it, it does slow the disease process still, um, but the most uh, benefit you get is the first few years. And Aricept 23 you're bringing out is a, is a new um, dosage of Aricept. Traditionally, we've been using 10 milligrams for 10 years. Um, 23 was, uh, you know, invented by the drug companies because the patent was running out on the 10 milligram. Um, actually has run out, is now a generic, and so they came up with a new dosage. Um, to be honest with you, I mean, studies haven't been that uh, convincing that 23 milligrams is significantly better than 10 milligrams. Um, so, uh, and, and the cost is much higher, and, and cost does become an issue for, for patients. But, um, um, but anyway, um, generally, yeah, about, about a couple of years, about two years or so. Doctor, uh, that's the worst half of the family here. <laughs> I would. Uh, I'd like to make a statement on your fish and uh, the Mediterranean diet. And, uh, I'm really concerned that I didn't hear anything about the red wine. <laughs> 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 but was that omitted uh, purposely? Or yeah. Is no, uh, good for you? <laughs> yeah, red wine is. Um, it's it's such an interesting story because the uh, <laughs> the chemical in the red wine that has been touted as being this um, anti-aging antioxidant is called resveratrol, and resveratrol has zero bioavailability. So I explain, you know, when you take something by mouth, it has to absorb through your stomach, get into your circulation to be effective. So resveratrol has zero percent bioavailability yet. They're making hundreds of millions of dollars a year selling it still, and um, a big drug company tried to develop it, and they found that was that was the big problem. It wasn't well absorbed. So if there is something good about red wine, we haven't discovered what it is yet. It, there, there, there still could be something good about it. So I would encourage you to um, have your usual red wine. I'm not even going to say how much is your usual. I'm just going <laughs> to encourage you. But uh, yeah, it was a, it's a great story about um, the lack of bioavailability. Uh, and you can, if you go online, they're still selling bottles of these resveratrol capsules, even though everyone knows it doesn't get absorbed at all. You're better off drinking the whole red wine than you are taking the resveratrol capsule. I shouldn't be saying that. Great really. question, you know what Mr. I mean. Pearson. Okay, Audrey's next. Yes, I have. I have one question. <clears throat> I'm looking for the good news. Uh, and you mentioned sockeye salmon. That's the only good news I've heard today. Uh, the farm salmon, okay, is less red, and my understanding is that they feed some kind of chemicals to the farmed fish in order to make them redder. Um, is there a big difference in terms of its value? Uh, because it's so much readily available, and sockeye is very expensive. Yeah, and it makes a good point. Um, I'll finish with the conclusion. My conclusion is that Farmed fish can be r really nutritious if it's fed and cared for correctly. There is some environmental impact, I know, but uh, the story about farmed salmon was that in order to make them grow fast and get big in captivity, 
they started to feed them these the highly very highly nutritious feed, but the feed didn't contain the natural krill that they usually eat. And so after their first tries with this, the big salmon, they would look at the flesh and it would be gray, it wouldn't be red. And so they quickly thought, oh, we have to feed them that krill to restore the um, color. And so when they started to feed them the krill and they started to get the natural astaxanthin again, the color did come back, but also the body weight and reproductive health improved of the fish. And so they realized that it's not just a pigment, it's something that really helps the fish and it also helps cattle and it also helps human, I believe. And so it's, it's a great story that even though they tried to make industrialize the fishing by creating this highly nutritious feed, by leaving out the stuff that's in the natural food chain of the salmon, you know, they really compromised the health and the flesh color and everything. And they easily restored that just by restoring the krill. So farmed salmon can be highly nutritious and high quality but in most cases, they don't go that far. You know, you, you do lose quality in most farm fish at this point. It might have something to do with the expense of the feed or something like that. But sockeye salmon is always caught wild, and it's managed very efficiently in um, Alaska so that when the salmon are coming back, doing their migration, they're coming back all red and filled with krill. That's when they catch them, and that's when they're at their best. And so you can get them at most any market. And it's expensive, but you can also get a can. It's not bad at all. Okay, we're going to take one or two. We have Audrey back here. Okay, I have uh, t uh, two different things that I, wa I wanted to mention. And first, I very much want to thank Senior Concerns for helping for the care of the Alzheimer's patients. As I used to be a CNA home health aide and having to work with some of them in their homes, of knowing the difficulty that the relatives and the caregivers have gone through with them. So for that and giving them the break, you're to be totally commended. Thank you. And, oh, my pleasure, believe me. And understanding the need for this, which is very much a need. And my second question was, as far as an MRI and the PET scan, what's the difference between the two and how much of a difference can each one show or to prove of the illness? Um, the MRI is a, an imaging study looking at the structure of the brain. Um, CAT scan would fall in that category too, just looking at the brain structure. Um, has there been atrophy or shrinkage of certain uh, structures of the brain? Whereas a PET scan is a functional imaging study. Um, you actually inject a, uh, a type of sugar or glucose uh, into, the, uh, into the person and measure how much is uh, absorbed by the brain. So they both give different uh, information. Thank you. And we'll take our last question from Lorraine and then we need to wrap up. My question goes to um, family intervention with Alzheimer's, so it can be answered by any of you. Maureen mentioned that there's a 60% death rate in caregivers to Alzheimer's patients prior to the patient themselves dying. I'm sure the burnout factor is even higher than that. So my question is, if you are caring for an Alzheimer's patient at home, when is the time to have them move to assisted living or some kind of facility care? And if you if they are resistant and you don't have the proper legal authority, how do you overcome that obstacle? That's um, the $10 million question. I don't have the $10 million answer. Um, caregivers, I struggle with caregivers when I know that if you know, 10 of us at the center cannot manage um, a person with really quite advanced uh, Alzheimer's disease. I know there's no way that a family member is caring for them at home. It's getting them before a crisis happens to make sure that they have their little ducks in a row, that they've been and looked at alternatives, that they've spoken to the people that can help them that can give them resources. And, and Laurie Bliss, a lot of you know from, this, from Senior Concerns is, is our archeologist. She's the best digger going, finding resources for people. It's partly it's getting the family to let go and look at what's out there. The other side of it is it's very expensive to get people to move um, into a residential facility. Um, 
is very difficult. It's it's one of the most difficult. And I start it early. You know when when I start. How are you going at home? How are you doing things at home? You know, we've seen this happen at the centre. How how are you coping at home with it? And they're struggling with that. So we I start the ball rolling quite early if I can, but usually it's a crisis. It's a crisis that happens. Somebody's wandered off, which is a big thing that families say, no, no, they'll never do. They'll never wander out the door. They've never done that before. And four hours later one day, we find somebody sitting outside Thousand Oaks Post Office. And if it hadn't have been for them calling and saying, we've got somebody loitering, he'd have sat there all night because he didn't know where he was going. So it's a crisis that usually starts the ball for the families, which is really sad. And they've been put in against their will. Um, it really depends on if... Yeah, if they've got power of attorney. Yeah. No, not even that, right? Yeah. Not even power no, of attorney. You, you can only be that if you're a, a psychiatrist or police or a mental health specialist can, can do what's called a 5150 on someone, um, bring them to the uh, emergency room. They're felt to be a danger to themselves or others. Um, um, in order for a family member to do that, you have to have what's called conservatorship, um, which is a legal um, mechanism to basically make decisions for another person. So the emergency room is really your fallback? Well, that or you can bring them into their, their doctor, um, but eventually they need to see a psychiatrist. And oftentimes, like Maureen says, if it is a crisis and there's behavioral issues and they have to be hospitalized in a psychiatric hospital, get things under control. And then once things are symptomatically under control, then the family can make decisions. So that's why it's so important to start early and just say, I just want you to know what your options are. Maybe it's six months from now, maybe it's a year from now, maybe it's 18 months from now, but start looking and getting prepared. Um, this way you can avert the crisis. All right, Council on Aging, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Rishton, Dr. Resick, and Maureen. Thank you. Well, I'd like to add my, uh, my thanks to the, to the panel and for this very informative session. And once again, to senior concerns, our partners, our friends, and what a blessing you are to our community. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Brenda. Thank you. We will now move on to uh, agenda item number six and a report on safety and emergency and a one call reaches all program. Leonard? As I was uh, growing up and growing into positions of more and more authority and responsibility, I became more and more uh, impressed with the idea of having needing a couple of pairs of eyes, second pairs of eyes. And I'd like to point out that <clears throat> having spell check doesn't relieve me from that responsibility because if I'm farming for fish, which kind of fits what went before, uh, and let's suppose I'm farming for carp, with the same letters involved in the word carp, I can make a word for excrement when I don't mean it, and spell check and grammar check won't pick it up. So my uh, request for a proposal for a new fish farm will turn out badly. We seniors need a second pair of eyes. We need a second pair of eyes, uh, and it really shouldn't be somebody close to us. It should be a trusted friend, perhaps, usually sometimes a lawyer. The second pair of eyes uh, helps us out with anything that affects our lives in a major way. In a reverse mortgage, is that good for me? Uh, do I really drive as well as I think I do? Is that kind looking structure, a stranger at my front door really trying to find their lost dog? Is that fellow walking or driving up and down my street really just lost? Is the person at my door really from the city code compliance department? Is the person claiming to be a cable repair person really here because there is trouble with my cable? In the case of financial affairs, we use, I use, and I hope you do too, a trusted advisor, a knowledgeable friend, and in my case, uh, our case, a paid lawyer. In lesser or perhaps just as dangerous situations, we are urged to make use of our police department. Something uh, odd is happening on the street. So we go to the f uh, phone and we dial 654-9511. Uh, 
Doesn't look like the cable guy to me. 65-4-95-11. I hope everybody at home is awakened now after sockeye salmon in their tummies, and they are remembering 65-4-95-11. The person driving slowly up and down the street and casing the place, I call 65-4-95-11. The, uh, and, and for anything else, 65-4-95-11 is going to get us to police dispatch. We are urged, we are invited, we are strongly asked to call 65-4-95-11 any time something out of the order, ordinary goes on in our streets. Uh, I don't, we're not running a banner. I was originally supposed to talk to us also about um, something called a callback uh, or reverse dialing. I found that the system is inter iterated, and I found that it's now called T.O. City Alert, and I have found finally that I've been locked out of it, that I have never existed since the time that I talked to you all um, about two years ago about the efficacy of having a reverse callback or um, a, 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 some sort of a program like that. I guarantee you that I will be prepared to let you know what happened with me next time. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Leonard. Uh, and now a report on transportation. David? Yeah, that was a nice, catchy tune there, Leonard. What was the number? 65 <laughs> All right. It's indelibly there. Um, last uh, month's meeting telecast, we had Mike Hauser from the uh, Thousand Oaks transportation analyst come and give us an idea of what he is proposing as far as changes to the transit system here in Thousand Oaks. Mike took the information that he had and went before the Tra Thousand Oaks Traffic and Transporta Transportation Advisory Commission. Uh, they pretty much went along with what um, Mike was pre presented to us, except one of the major exceptions was to have a two-tier increase in the fare for dial-a-ride. Uh, and so there, Mike is still looking to present um, his information to the tr May 24th, this 24th, uh, city council meeting with his proposal of increases and uh, uh, fair modification. So if you do want to have uh, a voice in how that's enacted, please come to that meeting. Um, a couple other things. Um, I would hope anybody who's using the dial-a-ride or uh, uh, the dial-a-ride has seen the brochure that's updated the different categories and how dial-a-ride is operated now, the procedure. Uh, that is very elaborative on what is going on now and what you can expect from the folks who are running the dial-a-ride. One specific thing is I would ask anyone who uses dial-a-ride to please tell the dispatcher if you're making a round-trip reservation. I think this will help folks as far as understanding. Oh. Got a little prompt here. It's this uh, this particular brochure printed on both sides. You probably can't see it. Oh well, I guess the reflection. But it is available, please, and to make sure you understand uh, what Mike and Cheryl Seifert have done over at MV Transportation to make this more accommodating and more efficient. Um, so please contact Cheryl who is in the audience today. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, at, uh, now it's not gonna be as catchy as Lynn, but it's 375-5467, the uh, City Oaks Transportation, to get updated on, on uh, Dial-A-Ride and any other questions you have for transportation. Um, did want to acknowledge some of the other folks who were, came here to support uh, one of our members in the transit team, transportation team, Sandy Kane and Audrey, and I know Dennis was here earlier, and Don. Um, we do want to, talk hopefully maybe next time about um, an experiment one of our transportation members did as far as utilizing Dial-A-Ride and the public bus system. Very good, thank you. All right, we'll move on to liaison reports and again back to you, David. All right, first off we want to hear from a retired senior volunteer program, Marty. Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, RSVP is very concerned right now about the plan to eliminate funding for the, na for the Corporation for National and Community Service. They provide the funding for RSVP nationwide. 
Now, volunteers from RSVP provide things like Meals on Wheels. Uh, they distribute meals uh, to homebound seniors, often their only contact with the outside world. They also, volunteers work on Shop Ahoy, who shop for groceries for people who just can't get out, shop for themselves. Uh, volunteers in policing free up police officers to do actual police work. They work at the library, and as you know, the library budget has been cut a lot, and they need volunteers uh, even more than ever. 31 volunteers prepared about 1,300 income tax returns for 1,000 seniors and for 300 low-income persons. These people could not afford to pay a paid provider to provide these returns. They often would have had to go with actually violating the law and not bothering to file at all. It would have cost about $400,000 for these people to have their tax returns prepared, and we obtained $600,000 in refunds that they could not have gotten otherwise. That brought a million dollars back into our community to be spent on groceries, clothing, food, things like that. Overall, RSV provides 12, in this area alone, 1,200 volunteers who donate 300,000 hours of time each year, which we calculate to be worth about $6 million. Now, that's just here in the Conejo Valley. The budget for the Corporation of National and Community Services is $50 million nationwide. It certainly seems like an expense well worth having, since it brings back a lot more. It pays more than pays for itself. Uh, the only thing I can suggest is that you contact Congress and see what you can do about preventing them or asking them not to cut the funding for the Corporation for National and Community Services. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Marty. Uh, I know it's going to be somewhat abbreviated, but here comes our here comes Andrea with the Gobelet Senior Adult Center information. I always talk fast anyway, so just listen fast. Um, so here you go. So we've got lots of cool things coming up here. Um, tonight's our Professors in Pastries. It's uh, Filipinos in Ventura County, so exploring early Filipinos in Ventura County and the challenges of documenting their hidden history. Um, our intergenerational chess club is starting back up, back by popular demand and with extended times. So this was a wonderful intergenerational program um, with our experienced chess players at the center, um, testing their skills against elementary to middle age school kids. Um, first half hours instruction, and then after that, um, following hour or so is designed for games, and it went over really, really well, so I'm glad to have them back. We do have a cons and scams a seminar coming up Wednesday, May 11th at 3.30. Um, so try to figure out a, all the ways that the con artists are out there to try and get your money on home repairs and billings and on the internet and more because there's a lot of hidden stuff. Uh, this one is good for everybody and it's still spring. We're almost into summer, but it's a declutter workshop. So if you have too much stuff or not enough places for things or you're looking at downsizing or you just don't know where to start, then this is for you. So um, this is presented by uh, Regina Lark, a professional organizer, and that will be May 18th at 3.30. And we're going to have a wonderful solutions seminar. It's a panel. And uh, it'll, so you can come and learn about the services in our area, uh, opportunity to listen to all the um, different uh, experts in the field. Like what are your options when you do need care at home or if you can't stay at home anymore and you need to go on further, um, looking at care facilities, um, and just finding out about our, our local services and any costs that are out there and how to plan for stuff because we don't like to do that because it's scary and spooky but um, this is a really cool presentation and they will have um, a light dinner with that and the next big one is the Ms. Senior Caneo Valley uh, pageant it's awesome it's fun we're in our third year it's going really really well and we have uh, quite a few uh, people already registered for it so I'm excited that'll be Sunday May 2nd at 1 30 to 4 and um, admission is five dollars for spectators so come and root on all the people that are that are coming to that then in June January uh, blah, 
Generation Celebration, I have moved it because Amgen does the last tour thing on that whole weekend, and it's become difficult, so I moved it to um, June 4th. And um, you were just talking about our tax program, and Richard During will be doing once a month, which is the third Thursday of each month from 9 to 1 p.m. So if you have an IRS problem or a tax question or you're looking at doing something with your stocks or bonds, anything that could affect affect your next year's taxes, come see him before you go and do that. Um, And you would need to call the RSVP office because they're handling the reservations for that one. So if you're looking at tax counseling time frame, it's 381-2742. And then you were talking about dial ride We now sell the dial ride tickets right there at the Global Senior Adult Center. Uh, you must have exact change. They're $1.50 each. You can buy as many as you want. And um, that way you don't have to worry about carrying cash and trying to break down your $20 bills that the machines only spit out at us anymore. Uh, so that makes it easy. So that's it in a nutshell. If you've got any questions on any of this, call 805-381-2744. And trips go on sale Friday, May 13th. Los Angeles tour. Um, you, this was going to be a fun one. I want to do it. You're going to have step on guides with tours of the Music Center, Cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels, Olvera, Olvera Street, Walt Disney Concert Hall, lunch at Felipe's, and free time to shop at the Farmer's Market. Uh, we're also doing the Museum of Natural History. So that one, you'll get the motor coach round trip, the history, lunch at the HMS Bounty Restaurant, admission, and self guided tour. And that includes the Butterfly Pavilion. If you've never been to a Butterfly Pavilion, it's just awesome. They're really cool. And we're doing a summer baseball game, Dodgers versus Arizona Diamondbacks. And they're infield reserves, so they're decent tickets, and they're on the third base side. And that's what I've got. Any questions? Thank you, Andrea. We move on to uh, agenda item number eight, special events, program announcements. Um, Nancy, if you, can you give us an update on uh, Senior of the Year? Sure, Jim. Um, this is a subject very dear to my heart. It's to honor our many wonderful volunteers we have in the city of Thousand Oaks. And uh, we have eight nominees, all of whom I've personally spoken to this year. And some of them I got to break the news that they had been nominated by the group that they volunteered for, which was super neat. And also it was one of them's birthday, and she was really excited. So we have eight nominees that are just all amazing. Uh, Joanne Chang, Leonard Chapman, Lois Friss, Sally Garcia, Ron Gellenbeck, George Jones, Susan Keene, and Tony Raslam. All of these people are just fun to talk to besides just contributing a huge amount to to the community. They will be uh, honored at a dinner and dancing on June 2nd, 2011 at 5.30 p.m. at the Goebel Center. And we are going to have entertainment by the Aristocats. It's going to be catered by Stonefire Grill, uh, barbecued chicken, garlic mashed potatoes, Caesar salad, surprise dessert. Um, and I, I probably a lot of people have already eaten there, but I, it's, I love going there. So it should really be a nice thing. Get together, get a group of people, get a table. It's only $6, and the tickets are available at Goble already. So please come. It's a really fun evening for $6. And go support, particularly if you know someone who's been nominated. Please go and support that person. It's a great, great honor. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. It, uh, it's one of the great fun things we get to do. Um, um, Martin, could you give us a little update on our June program real quick? Yeah, June 1st, our next meeting, we're going to have a panel on elder abuse. The panelists <laughs> will be uh, from law enforcement and from the district attorney's office. They will let you know what they're doing to prevent elder abuse and what you can do. Okay, super. That'll, that'll be great. Uh, are there any other program announcements? Uh, if not, we'll move on to Commissioner comments. Uh, I would like to very quickly say that uh, in June, we would like to give you an update on a recent uh, national conference that uh, the Council on Aging in the city were able to participate in. Uh, we're out of time right now, but it was a marvelous, uh, a marvelous conference that uh, gave Thousand Oaks, the Council on Aging, and the Senior Adult Master Plan some major publicity. Uh, We'll talk about that in June. Uh, Any other commissioner comments? David. If I may, 
Um, this past weekend, as part of the uh, start of Caneo Valley Day, they had the chili cook-off and car classic. Um, there are a lot of guys, including myself, who are trying to use their testosterone to chase away the Alzheimer's, and boy, we did rev it up. Uh, it was a wonderful event. Selfishly, I, I got to say, I, I did win uh, first prize, first place for my Dodge, 73 Dodge Charger. And boy, she, she was smiling all the time. But it was a wonderful event, and I hope you all can go to the Caneo Valley Days. I'd like to one, one, one little quick thing. Last week was an interesting week for me personally. I had uh, my fifth great-grandchild born and my 14th grandchild born. So uh, watch out, world. We're keeping on coming here. So any other commissioner comments? Yeah, just like salmon's fault. <laughs> yes. Jim, I'd like to wish all mothers a happy Mother's Day coming up this Sunday. Oh, thank you. And uh, go Lakers, we are adjourned. <laughs>